reading to us that uh, key passage from the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, the notes for today's sermon are in the leaflet, which is not yet on the web page, but I'm, I'll send it to Ken shortly so that it will be uploaded. So if you want to follow uh, the sermon uh, with some downloaded notes, you'll be able to get that. But I want to, to uh, look in particular at this council that met in Jerusalem. What were they, what were they doing and why, and why would it be of interest to us? Um, so I've used this uh, image, which is the cover of a book, actually, on the First Council of Jerusalem. It's a, a council which is recognized by Christians uh, all around the world as having great significance and uh, should guide all of us, the Jerusalem Council. I want to deal with three aspects of it. Uh, first of all, I want to think about who's who in Jerusalem, why are they there? Then we want to think about the issue. Is it just tradition versus innovation? What's, what, uh, uh, is it sort of uh, something that we often see today where conservative forces say one thing and sort of innovative and experimental ideas are on the other hand? Is that what it is or is it something more? And then thirdly, I want to notice uh, three things, two of which are guiding principles that I think come out of the letter, which was... Uh, summarizing the results of their conference. So let's think, first of all, about who's who in Jerusalem and why are they there. Well, I, I looked again at the, the journey from uh, Antioch to Jerusalem uh, on uh, Google Maps. Uh, it's, uh, to my great astonishment when I looked at it, it said it was something like a four-hour flight. And I thought, oh, it can't possibly be that, that far. It's, it's actually a 134-hour walk if you use the walking track that comes along the high country down the backbone of Israel and Jordan. Uh, today, it would be a very difficult journey to do because of the boundaries, because of the shortage of fuel, because of the terrible situation in, in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, but in Paul's day, of course, this was uh, Phoenicia and Samaria, and they stuck to the coast. Uh, and presumably, it, it took about a week why were, the, why were Paul and Barnabas doing this journey? Well, the answer was that up in Antioch, there had been some dissension. That after Paul and Barnabas had gone off on their missionary exploration, which we thought about a week or two ago, uh, when they came back, they stayed a long time, but there were reasons for that. They, Peter had been there, and Peter had come, and, and he had, uh, had fellowship with the new Christians, but then some of the... the uh, Pharisaic or the circumcision party, as it's described, came along and said, no, no, you shouldn't be eating with, uh, with Gentiles. I mean, they're, they're getting their meat from the pagan temples. They're eating, uh, they're eating blood. Uh, they're doing all sorts of things that you as a Jew shouldn't do. And Peter withdrew from them. And how do we know this? Well, in that long time that Paul and Barnabas stayed in, in uh, Antioch, uh, we understand that the letter to the Galatians was written. And you'll find that information in the letter to the Galatians in chapter 2. So in chapter 2, Peter is rebuked by, by the Apostle Paul and says he, he was, had to be corrected on this, which is a pretty strong confrontation. Uh, and you can, and as, you, as you read about it, you realize that this, uh, this uh, letter uh, had a huge impact, uh, as we shall see, and then, of course, Peter uh, is back in Jerusalem when Paul and Barnabas go down there. And the idea is to take this matter to the leaders of the church, to the apostles in Jerusalem. And that's exactly what we're told they do. Uh, the, uh, the ones in Antioch who had started the disruption, uh, saying that you cannot be, uh, be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires, and Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument about this. So it, it was a, a strong contention. And uh, so it was decided that Paul and Barnabas should go to Jerusalem. Of course, there they would meet with Peter again. And as, you, as, as uh, Amanda read the passage, uh, you probably caught on to the idea that uh, there was a, a measure of 
attentiveness. Uh, how, what should be done when there's a strong disagreement? Well, um, we shouldn't just turn our backs and not be talking to the other party. We should be engaging in careful listening and, and careful thinking. And this is what was uh, the, the goal in Jerusalem, was to think about this. And so uh, James was there in Jerusalem as well. Now this James, we believe, was James the brother of Jesus. All right. So remember, early on, uh, the brothers of Jesus and his sisters thought he was mad at one point. You know, uh, so they weren't following him from the beginning. But after Pentecost, uh, they came into the church and uh, James became the leader of the Jerusalem church after the death uh, of, of several of the other key players. And so James is there. And later on, we read that uh, Bar Sabbas, who had the first name of or another name, uh, Judas, Judas Barsabbas, to distinguish him, 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 of course, from the Judas who betrayed Jesus. Uh, this Judas and Silas, a new name that's going to come up again later in the Acts of the Apostles. These two are delegated as the authorized uh, bearers of the letter. In those days, they didn't have passwords like we do, so you, you didn't have to log on and type in a password or a, a, a PIN number. Uh, so how did you know if a letter was genuine? The answer was, who brought it to you? All right. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, in, the, in the centuries which followed, there were a number of uh, letters which were written, which uh, were given the names of the apostles, but it had no connection at all to the apostles. Uh, I won't bother mentioning any, but if you've read anything of Dan Brown and the uh, Da Vinci Code, you'll know he likes to play around with those other later documents and suggest that they were, in fact, the earlier ones. So, so who's who in Jerusalem? Well, Paul and Barnabas have to sort this issue out, and they're gathering with the apostles. Now, the problem, what is the problem in Jerusalem? Is it just traditionalists resisting change? Or is the situation more complex than that? Because it seems like we've got the law, the circumcision party, uh, those who are, who are in favor of the Levitical uh, dietary laws, uh, and they're resisting Peter's vision. This is an extraordinary thing. It was Peter who had the vision and who saw in Cornelius and his household uh, the marks that had marked out the, the early believers in Jerusalem and he baptized them because of the faith that they professed. And we see all nations starting to be gathered. But hey, maybe it wasn't a big enough flood. Maybe it was just a, a trickle. But Peter had this vision. And remember, it was repeated. It's recorded in, the, in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. Peter had already been carried forward to see that the Gentiles, that all nations, were to be included. He'd be reminded of this. The idea, of course, goes back to the very beginning uh, of the uh, book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 12, when God takes Abraham and brings him out of uh, Iraq, as it is today, to a land of promise. It says, through you, and you, I will bless all the nations of the earth. And so at the back of Judaism is this big idea, and it surfaces again and again in the Old Testament writings, that uh, God didn't choose Israel because they were big and powerful, but he chose them because they were nothing. They were nobody. But he was going to make somebody of them and bring, bring his blessing to all the nations through them. A great promise. And it turned out uh, not like uh, so many of the Jews believed, but uh, to the, the devout and the pious ones that are mentioned, for example, in our Christmas stories, the beginning of Luke's Gospel, uh, we, we have those who are open to God changing and doing something wonderful. So how could this dispute make progress? We've got this, what seems like, uh, division between uh, tradition and innovation. But it's more than this. And this is what we need to look at. We need to look a little bit more closely. It seems like tradition versus innovation, but in fact, it's not that. It's not just blind tradition, and it's not just innovation. Actually, what we're seeing is something totally different. The question is, what is the gospel? What is the good news for the world? 
And the answer one party was given was, well, it's about Jesus, but you need to be, uh, if you, you need to be circumcised, you need to be, uh, you need to adhere to the Jewish food laws, and, and uh, you need to remember the Sabbath, and there's a whole string of things that had to be done as well. So in a sense, the gospel wasn't about good news, it was about good advice. Get Jesus in your life and get this and get that and get the other thing. And, and all of these things will make you acceptable to God. But actually, the, the contrast is that the gospel is good news. It's about what God has done for you and how he sees you in Christ. And you're his. And you're his beloved child. And that's all the difference. It's about what God has done for us. The gospel is good news. It's not for nothing that the, uh, the Bible translation uh, was given in the 1960s to the, uh, the, the then translation was the good news Bible. It's picking up on this idea that the gospel is not good advice. It's good news. So here is the, the change. They've, the work is finished. Christ said on the cross, it is finished. He has done what is necessary. The cross is the central theme that goes on from there. Paul mentions it again uh, to the, to the uh, Corinthians. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Christ my Lord. And in, in Galatians, uh, sorry, in, in, in Colossians, he tells us that what circumcision represented has been replaced by baptism. And, and he says, in him you were baptized. You were, circum when you, were, you were circumcised when you were baptized, which really is a change of heart. That change of heart that opens you to Jesus. So the points of view have been shared. And what do they do? Well, they come to a, a conclusion about what should be done. I just think James's words here are so wise. Uh, first of all, there's no need for circumcision. They're not going to impose this on the Gentiles. They can see that what circumcision represented, being in God's covenant, has already happened with the, with the Gentiles. They've been brought into the covenant people of God through Christ. So there's no need for circumcision. And there's going to be uh, danger here of giving offense. What's going to happen? Because all around the Mediterranean there were synagogues and people in the synagogues were starting to believe in Jesus. Had they to forsake their Judaism? Uh, or, uh, was that no longer, was that out? No. What about the Gentiles who were coming in or the ones who were, were interested in the, uh, in the Jewish God, the one God of Israel, the God-fearers who had attached themselves to the synagogue? Need they be circumcised? Need they switch their diets completely? What was to happen here? And the answer seemed to be, there's no need for circumcision, but there's no needless offense. We don't want to give any offense. And of course, in a, in a world where the day-to-day -day life was uh, associated with uh, eating meat that had been offered in pagan temples, uh, dietary things that were offensive to Jewish people, uh, and, and, and behaviors which were out of ex ex totally unacceptable, uh, they mentioned, look, we don't want offense to be caused by this range of things. And so they mentioned the things which came in at, at the, the end of the letter. We, we didn't actually read those things, but let me read them to you now. It says, uh, The Holy Spirit and we have agreed to put in, put, not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to idols. Eat no blood. Eat no animal that, that has been strangled and keep yourselves from sexual immorality. So here are some guidelines. And if the uh, Gentile believers uh, conform in this way, they won't offend the Jewish believers. And so together they will commend the message of Jesus. So here is the, the uh, circumstance. Later on, uh, well not later on, it seems that Paul had already written to the Galatians and in this letter that he had written in uh, around the year between 48 and 50, we can't be certain, uh, he says this in chapter 3. In Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female, 
Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in com a common relationship with Jesus Christ. That relationship is our faith in him. We trust him. We trust that he has given himself for us and that by that act, the gospel is, has opened up to the whole world. That if we trust him, we are included in God's love and favor and our sins have been forgiven and we have forsaken the idols that were part of our lives, perhaps the money that we pursued. Christine mentioned how love of money lets you down, a book for teenagers, but some of us take a lot longer to realize that. So here, here it is. Uh, the the uh, relationship with God is established through Jesus Christ our Lord. At, uh, at the end last week, uh, I put up a quotation from Greg Sheridan. Let me remind it, you of it. He said in his latest book, instead of mounting a military or political challenge, Paul revolutionized the inner identity of pagan society. He tore its mind out. In his lucid, penetrating, unprecedented writings, he left a, bl a blueprint of how it was done. He tore its mind out. The mind that said that there were hierarchy, that the emperor was divine, that there was society was hierarch had a hierarchical structure. We can see it in the writings of uh, Yuval Harari, an Israeli uh, atheist. Uh, philosopher and, uh, and writer today who, who says that in the future we're mo moving back to the areas when there will be uh, super people and there will be disposable sapiens. Uh, it's awful to contemplate some of the dystopian scenarios he envisages where the, the ultra-rich uh, create communities of their own and leave outside those who are virtually expendable. It's uh, so, so far a cry from what the New Testament puts before us, which is that we need to change our mind. That's what repentance is. It's a change of mind. He tore their mind out. And so Gentile people started to repent and say, yes, I need forgiveness. And the God of the Jews, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, his message has come to flower, to fulfillment. And so... The old ways that prepared for this moment are, are fast falling away and, and the, uh, the Gentiles are being grafted in, as Paul is later to write in the letter to the Romans. So John Stott says, in commenting on this, they had to uh, save the gospel from corruption by saying no to circumcision, but they had to produce harmony and save the gospel from save the churches from dissension and division, and they gave advice about that. No needless offence. And the third thing was that message had to be communicated back to the church at Antioch, and so uh, Barsabbas and Silas were commissioned to do that to take that message. And we have the uh, vestige of the letter here in the uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter fifteen. I commend it to you. It follows on from where. Amanda finished reading. And so let us uh, think about these things as we uh, teach and learn the truth together and as we seek to give no offense to those whose lives are different as we share with them the good news that God is love and his love is redeeming love. Now I'm going to invite Amanda to play for us. Uh, she'll introduce the piece. Thank you, Amanda. I'm going to play uh, Saraband <clears throat> from Bach's uh, Suite for Solo Cello in G major. His first suite. G major is a key full of hope. I think.
Thank you, Amanda. Full of hope indeed. Shall we now join our hearts in prayer? Let us pray together. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that the renewal of creation and the blessing of humanity was your pledged intention. It is awesome that the blessing to the nations today is the outcome of your covenant with Abraham. We thank you that the hope never died. We thank you that we who are so distant in time, geography and culture are nevertheless beneficiaries of your grace through faith in Jesus, your beloved Son. In him we find acceptance and come now as your children in prayer. As we bow before you, we recognize that we are unworthy of your mercy. Our egotism and greed cry out against us. We have done those things we ought not to have done. And the things that we ought to have done, we have left undone. Forgive us. In the face of our guilt, you sent your beloved Son to atone for all our unrighteousness. And so guilt is gone. Your joy has been bequeathed to us. Looking upon us now, you are the first to see our best and not our worst. You are working your will on earth as in heaven. Perhaps we've known of Jesus all our lives and experienced his love communicated in our family or church circles since infancy. Perhaps he's come to us as a joyful discovery relieving a recent crisis. We give thanks for those who share the message of Jesus with us. Help us as a church to keep the redeeming love of Jesus central, recognizing that we can add nothing to his salvation, neither can anyone take us from his care. We pray for Christian brothers and sisters seeking to worship you in difficult and dangerous places. Today we pray for all countries ravaged by war and injustice, especially for Afghanistan, where people had begun to enjoy improved standards of health and education. We are horrified as we watch all this being swept away by the return of the Taliban. Please comfort those who now fear their loved ones gave their lives in vain. Please prosper efforts to evacuate those who worked with Western allies and those whose lives are now at risk. Today we pray for the churches in Australia that as in the Jerusalem Council, so in committees and assemblies, may your church promote honest and helpful debate. May the Holy Spirit cause us to work together for the cause of your kingdom with all who call Jesus Lord. We ask for the state and federal leaders to manage the public health issues created by COVID so that lives are saved and livelihoods protected. Help each of us to play our part in halting the virus and supporting one another to promote good health in the community. We're conscious that there are surging cases of infection in other countries. Thank you that vaccines got through to East Timor this week. We remember elderly, vulnerable and sick friends this morning who along with parents of school children will face difficulty in the extension of the lockdown. Please bring encouragement, healing and hope to them now as we commit them to you in the silence of our hearts. Lord, help them to cast all their care on you and to know you care for them. We ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray and say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you and with those whom you love and with all the church of God. Amen. <coughs>